Uh, thank you to those of you who have joined us today for this conversation with our wonderful judge Courtney Weeks, and we'll be talking about community safety and the courts. And we appreciate uh, you taking the time to be with us, Judge Weeks, and we appreciate uh, those of you who have joined us today. And we look forward to this informative conversation uh, about this intersection between the courts and community safety. It's something that's on the, uh, community safety of course is on the forefront of a lot of our minds. And uh, it's gonna be really good to hear from uh, Judge Weeks about her perspective and the reality of how community safety intersects with the work that the courts uh, do. So um, I would like to uh, tell you a little bit about Courtney Weeks. She lives here in the North Valley of Albuquerque. She was born and raised here in Albuquerque and graduated from the University of Kansas with uh, distinction and honor, honors. Uh, she went, returned to New Mexico and attended law school where she met her husband, Jason, and she graduated from law school in 2007. Uh, her career began at the second judicial district attorney's office where she pr uh, prosecuted criminal cases in Metro Court and went on to work on felony DWIs. And uh, she then entered private practice and focused on criminal defense work and then was nominated by a bipartisan judicial nominating commission composed of judges, attorneys, as well as non-lawyers in the summer of 2013. And she went on to win the general election in the fall of 2014. And uh, so please join me in welcoming Courtney Weeks, Judge Courtney Weeks to this conversation. And I'll let you take it from here, Courtney, and tell us a little bit about what you're doing now and uh, from what, where I left off, what's, what's happening with you. Uh, thank you so much. So yeah, just to reiterate, I obviously was uh, born and raised here. Um, I'm actually, I guess, a first generation New Mexican. I was a transplant. Um, my dad uh, got a PhD from Purdue University and was recruited by Sandia National Labs. Um, and then my mom was a school teacher. Uh, she taught kindergarten and first grade um, at APS uh, for I think like 25 or some odd years before she retired. Um, but we obviously love New Mexico. Um, and my husband, I think, is a fourth or fifth generation New Mexico. So we've got some deep roots here. Um, I've been a Metropolitan Court judge for almost six years. It'll be six years in December. I was sworn in. Um, and since that time, I've just been really, really involved in part of this conversation. What we need to talk about, I think, is um, I've been extremely involved in the specialty court programs within Metropolitan Court. I started off with, um, I took over for Judge uh, Angle, uh, the Early Intervention Program, which is a pre-adjudication diversion program for first-time offenders of with domestic violence charges, um, where they do group uh, classes or they do group counseling sessions in order to move forward in life um, in a positive way. Uh, obviously, it's a lower level amount of intervention from a probation standpoint, uh, because a lot of these, uh, those types of offenders are low risk, low need, meaning that they don't need a whole lot of intervention just to make sure that they kind of get back on the right track. And we know that because they don't have an extensive arrest history. Um, and that program has been extremely successful. Um, it's, it's really popular within the court. And then um, after that, I took over what we call the behavioral health court program, um, which is a little bit more obviously intensive um, and it is specifically for obviously um, offenders that are suffering from severe mental illness. Um, and it can be any charge basically that you're charged with within um, at the misdemeanor level. And I should go back and clarify that the Metropolitan Court, because people don't always know what I do. Um, I'm the judge of division four, which is a criminal docket, which means I hear criminal misdemeanor cases, which is um, any, we're actually the only traffic court within Bernalillo County, but we also hear any misdemeanor crime, which means that it doesn't carry more than up to a year in the county jail. So that can be anything from a shoplifting um, to a traffic ticket all the way up to um, a third DWI offense or uh, domestic violence cases. So that's the nature of our court. 
So going back to the behavioral health court, um, we have currently have a contract with um, a provider where a lot of times these individuals that have um, are they in order to be eligible for the program, you have to be diagnosed with a severe mental illness. Um, and at that point, what happens is we um, get them services. A lot of these people are obviously um, self medicating um, through and through other more serious substances and are struggling with addiction, sometimes homelessness as well. So what our program does is we get them set up with um, a psychiatrist, we get them set up with um, counseling and treatment, which can include intensive outpatient treatment for specific substance abuse offenses. Um, and then also, uh, we have um, two separate case managers, one that is internal within the court and one that's external with the, our service provider. So they work on things like housing. Um, I mean, they'll help them get driver's licenses and documentation. That can be a really big struggle for some people sometimes. They don't even have an ID. Um, so we have case extensive case management services that'll help them with things like that. Um, and then when Chief, when uh, Judge Engel was chief, I also was her presiding, um, and this was up until very recently, I was the presiding judge of all of our specialty court programs within Metropolitan Court. So I kind of specifically talked to you about two where I started, um, and then I ended up helping with all 13 of them, which range um, from the Community Veterans Court is one of them, where um, self-identified veterans are able to get services through the VA, and they go through the program, obviously, um, with the intention that they uh, continue with those services. And again, the point of any of these programs is, is you're specifically identifying um, maybe a root cause of that type of criminogenic behavior based on something that's going on with their lives. So um, for the community veterans court, if you're a self-identified veteran and you can get those services, then you know a lot of the reason that you may be um, committing a crime or be having issues in that situation is based on the fact that you might be suffering from PTSD, um, and then the huge benefit of that particular program too is there's um, mentor veterans within the program. So there's other veterans that are actually participate in the program. So you have um, another individual that is actually, you can reach out to, you can call them basically at any point of day. Um, and that's a really cool program because it's that kind of camaraderie that builds people together. Um, and so I'll kind of be brief, but um, those are the, um, there's multiple other programs that help with, um, there's the two other specific ones I'll touch on briefly are the recovery court. That's our biggest program. And an offshoot of that is the healing to wellness, um, urban native American healing to wellness program. So those are specifically people that are charged and convicted with subsequent DWI offenses. So second and third DWI offenses. Um, and again, it's similar to um, the behavioral health court program in the sense that you are given an opportunity to, um, participate in intensive outpatient treatment. There's also opportunities to get people into inpatient treatment if that's their level of need. Um, and it's just a, it's, it's intensive supervision um, for, that's obviously specifically dealing with alcohol addiction, but the programs actually do work. Um, and the only other thing I will touch on very briefly before we go to the other questions and answers is the other thing I've done very extensively within the court system for the last, I think, at least two years, it might be a little bit longer than that, um, is I work with the BCJCC, so the Bernalillo County Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, that's always a tongue twister, um, where we work specifically, it's a county program where they bring in various stakeholders. Um, I'm actually um, on the executive committee of one of their subcommittees, which is the Reintegration and Reentry Subcommittee. Um, and I think it's been in the news there. Bernalillo County recently came up with a reentry center. Um, so everybody who actually gets released from custody goes through that center. Um, and be, the Bernalillo County in general has made a huge priority to make behavioral health issues um, a priority for this specific population. Um, and they're really working on expanding case management services. So people upon release are getting the services that they need. Um, and obviously our specialty court kind of plays a role in some of that, which is how I ended up getting involved in this. Um, and another cool project that I'm working on currently is trying to kind of develop systems and the BCJCC is working on this extensively to make sure that we're identifying people as they're booked into jail um, and identifying somebody that has a severe mental illness. So um, at the booking process, so that all these stakeholders that are involved, including APD, um, the county, the city, 
the courts or all the public defender department, the district attorney's office, we're all working together to try to make sure that these people get the services that they need. So they're not just cycling in and out of jail. Because the problem is a lot of times these people that, again, specifically with the mental illness issue, um, are kind of picking up or getting arrested on lower level misdemeanors or um, maybe felony offenses that are drug related, right? But they're not violent in nature necessarily. They're just needing the necessary treatment to kind of move forward better in life. But they kind of cycle through the jail system at an extensive uh, rate or at an extremely high rate because they're just kind of, because of the nature of what's going on with them, they kind of just go in, get released, get rearrested because they're not getting the appropriate services that they need. So I think that's kind of the, uh, I'll, that'll be the gist of my uh, introduction. I know that was kind of long. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's very intensive and it's very informative um, and it's a lot for those of us on uh, the outside because there's so much going on within the courts that is really wonderful to hear about and to know that it's happening even though we don't really have the opportunity to to see those workings um, from your perspective or from the perspective of others who who work with people within the courts and i think it's so important to know these things are going on and and uh so in your um perspective like what do you feel where do you feel our judicial system is then falling short it seems like there is a lot of uh, good going on. There are a lot of things happening to help support people, but where do you think that we may be falling short and, and where are we moving forward? What are some of the best things uh, that are happening that are moving us forward? So I think sometimes from the judiciary's perspective where we fall short is it's really easy um, in terms of this job to kind of, I mean, because it, it, when you're a judge, you're only making face-to-face -face contact for, with people for extremely short periods of time. Um, and I know a lot of people see this on the news, but when somebody's originally arrested, you know, they're on the video monitor. So sometimes we're not even seeing people in person when they've originally been arrested. We're literally just seeing them over a video. Um, and we're trying to make the best decisions that we can based on, you know, information that's been given to us um, and looking at somebody over a video for a few seconds. So I think that it's just very hard in those circumstances um, to try to think globally about what's going on um, in those situations. And I think as a judge, it's really hard um, on a regular basis because you're just kind of, you know, seeing people pushing people through. Um, and I think it does take a little bit extra work to actually kind of think um, holistically about what's going on because um, from a from just the job's perspective, and it's no fault of just the nature of the job itself, you're not going to be able to impact people individually just on that contact. You can, but it's harder to impact people, I think, individually with just that minimal amount of contact. So I think um, the judiciary's obligation is to go beyond just to the daily docket calling and beyond um, just doing the nine to five type of job that re is required for just calling cases, doing trials, you know, um, people's perspective of, you know, just calling balls and strikes um, to actually, there is opportunities like I just talked about within, um, with absolutely within the judiciary to give people um, opportunities to um, just make the community better and also to um, holistically think about what we can do as a community to improve um, the lives of individuals who are more prone to criminogenic behavior and ultimately improve the community as a whole. So I think that's kind of where the system, I don't know if that's where we are falling short. I think that's where the system can definitely fall short. Um, and where we're moving forward and where I see those massive improvements, um, I really commend the BCJCC tremendously, um, as well as the city and APD. Um, there's a lot of um, officers within APD now, um, specifically within the crisis intervention team, the CIT unit, that are actually really trying to uh, step outside the box and kind of think about how to deal with um, people that they interact with on a consistent basis, who they know within the community are suffering from severe mental illness and dealing with those people differently. So um, one of the ideas that the city and the community are coming up with are having these mobile crisis units. So when they make contact with somebody like that, 
they don't necessarily need to go to the emergency department. They don't necessarily need to get booked in jail, depending on the situation, obviously. Um, they can talk to a nurse practitioner or a medical provider that's within the unit, make contact with law enforcement too, if necessary, but kind of develop another plan in place. Um, if they have a healthcare provider, outside healthcare providers or case management services that they're already involved with, they can talk to them. Um, if not, then they can develop a kind of a strategy or plan moving forward to get them the medication that they need. Um, so I think that those are really, really progressive, pragmatic things that the city and the county are um, working on. Um, and then also, again, um, the county with that reentry and the reintegration center, there, there's been a lot of a lot of real good work on the forefront to try to identify these people. Um, and again, holistically, that's kind of where it starts. I think there's two problems. It's just the first part of that um, is the data collection part that um, the county has been working extremely hard on um, to kind of just it, make sure that we're actually getting the information and trying to appropriately screen people and trying to kind of identify these people that are cycling through the system on a consistent basis with a mental illness and then developing systems in place so they're actually, um, if they are in that, make that point of contact to the point where they are arrested, at least somebody else is kind of um, identifying them, tracking them, and making sure that they get the appropriate case management services and needs that they need moving forward. Um, and I don't know if people are familiar with, but the county has a program, it's been a while around for a while, called MATS, which is supposed to be just a deep detox program so it's a you can turn yourself in for just it's usually for just drug and alcohol detoxification but they've expanded that tremendously to also include people um, with mental health illnesses can check themselves in there too um, and expanded that program so you can actually stay for a little bit extended period of time if you qualify um, and the county's been working to um, to try to get other types of people routed into inpatient treatment programs and things like that faster as well so I think that's where we um, can do better. And that's where we've made, I think, a lot of progress in reference to that. Nice, nice. Yeah, it seems like there's some good work being done. And, and it, as you said, needs to be looked at holistically. And, um, and I imagine that that's something that some judges do better than others, which, um, what what would you say are the the three most significant qualities that a, a judge should bring to the job, and and uh, just in general, and how how do those impact community safety? Um, so I'm gonna have to think of the three really quick. I mean, I think um, I, the one that the first one that comes off of the top of my head um, is I think there has to be. Um, empathy more than anything. So kind of just an understanding of trying to meet people where they're at, um, because it's really, I think, easy again, and just that minimal first conversation that you're having to kind of um, pass judgment. Um, I think a lot of people, everybody does, but judges included are not, um, are not free from in their own implicit biases, right? So trying to just meet people where they're at, trying to let go of everything else that you're bringing to the table, um, and bring empathy to every single situation and try to understand where people are coming from um, and really try to understand the root cause of why people are, why what's happening is what <laughs> is what's happening because very few people are just um, committing crime for no reason or just, you know, sociopathic or just evil, you know, it's just not the nature of, you know, the human race and it's not the nature of the majority. Obviously there's some of that, but that's not the, the root cause or um, the nature of the majority of crime. Um, so I think that that's kind of the first. Um, with that being said, I think that you also have to, on the flip side of that, uh, judges also, I think a really important quality is also to, the opposite of that is to be um, tough when you need to be. Um, and again, talking about um, that holistic approach is, incarceration is one tool that is obviously necessary within our community and our society. Um, it can never go away, but I think that we need to think about how to use it um, in the most judicious way possible and reserve it for the people that are not only repeat offenders, but violent offenders um, for the purpose of connect, con, um, for the purpose of protecting the community. And so I think in general, what that means is that you have to, um, sometimes even if you want to be empathic, you're taking some of those other feelings that you have out of the equation to be tough and do what you need to do in order to 
you know, prioritize what's necessary in those situations. And um, that can absolutely be incarceration for sometimes extended periods of time. So I would say that's the second one. Um, and I think the third one uh, is a combination of uh, two things. So um, one of the, in terms of just like your demeanor and your philosophy, one of the most um, difficult things about, I think, being a judge is that you're always putting on that robe every single day and you're always having to, you know, have um, a good demeanor. You're always having to kind of be that same person who is consistently you have to be extremely consistent in terms of the way that you're treating people and the way that you're behaving, right? So that means that maybe if, you know, your kid kept you up all night or you, you know, your husband didn't make your coffee right that morning or something, you have to put all those other emotions or whatever else is going on with you personally um, in order to kind of move forward and just do your job. Um, but I think at the same time, one of the other important qualities in reference of your demeanor is always all, um, one of the things that's helped me a lot too, is it's really important to um, never take yourself too seriously, right? So you've got to kind of always kind of bring a sense of humor um, and kind of a level of just uh, humanness to your demeanor and the way that you interact with people as well. And I think that that helps a lot too. Oh, yeah, <laughs> there was, I can see how all of those would be really important to do a job well. And the, the tough job of being a judge. Um, so how will I mean, you have, you obviously bring these things to your job at the Metro Court, uh, but how will moving from metro court to district court expand your ability to um, promote community safety? Um, so again, just based on my background, uh, again, with the work that I've done with specialty courts um, and with the BCJCC, I think I've got a very good um, just background in kind of um, diversity in terms of thinking again holistically and outside the box about how to provide services better services for people and right now i do that at the misdemeanor level um so you're kind of thinking about other issues like things like potentially people that are you know, again with the mental illness and the homelessness um but at the misdemeanor level you're dealing with um, it in a little bit different way so I think that we can, I can do a lot at the district court level. So the position I'm running for, I should clarify, is for a criminal division in the district court. It's division 15. So I would be hearing felony cases, which ranges from anything from a fourth degree felony to up to the most serious um, homicides, murders, um, sex offender cases, the most serious crimes you can think of within our community. Um, so I think that there, the, all of the information and all the things that I have within my purview and I've purview and I've learned over the last six years, I really think that it's important to bring those to the felony level. Um, and they definitely have these programs in the district court as well. Um, they have the drug court program. Um, Judge Leos just started a young adult program, which is uh, really cool. It's tailored uh, to anybody from the age of, I believe, 18. Uh, to 26 um, who has been charged. And I know that um, it's really important to have that particular community or that particular court because anybody who watches the news can um, see, especially a lot of some of the um, gun violence and a lot of the violent crime within our community, I feel like it's getting, the offenders are getting younger and younger. Um, and so I think that those types of interventions for those um, individuals is extremely crucial. Um, but I just think that I do have an opportunity to expand the existing services that are over there now uh, and just continue to help this community as much as I can to, again, uh, identify the root cause of why certain criminogenic behaviors are happening um, and work on concepts like uh, risk and need assessments to try to meet and, again, meet people where they're at so we can provide services for people with the ultimate goal of um, what makes our community the safest is obviously making sure that people don't reoffend, don't commit new crimes in the future. Right, right. Because recidivism, it's it's costly in many ways, right? It's right. Um, and so, it, unless I always kind of think about it this way too, because unless you are sentenced for something extremely serious like murder, most of the time, the um, even at the felony level. A fourth degree felony only carries up to a year and a half in jail, which is, you know, a first time possession of drugs. Um, 
So, uh, or uh, same thing with uh, the first time you steal a car, it's only an 18 month sentence. So we can throw everybody in jail if we want, but that person after 18 months is still gonna have to come out. And it's actually shorter than that based on, you know, good time and other rules. So after, you know, if you, even if you maxed everybody out, then that person's still gonna have to figure out how to be a, per, a normal member of our society. Um, and all of the research and studies have shown that specifically, if you put somebody who is actually a low risk offender at the, first, at the time that they've um, just kind of started committing crime, if they're kind of a low risk, no low need person, if you incarcerate them for too long, you're actually increasing their chances of committing crime in the future. Um, incarceration is also extremely costly. So putting somebody in prison for 18 months versus giving somebody treatment and services for 18 months, the cost differential is just astronomical. Um, so I think it's really important that we think of that too from just a taxpayer standpoint um, and a practical standpoint as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and there's a lot of rhetoric now with law and order and, and uh, you know, so how would you respond to something like that? With um, I guess just the same thing is that, you know, you can't, um, and I know, uh, so I should say this too, I have a two and a half year old daughter and, you know, I've lived, other than the time that I left to go to college, I've lived within Bernalillo County or this community for my whole life, um, you know, and I'm, you know, raising a small child here. So I obviously, for personal reasons, want Bernalillo County to be as safe as possible. Um, and I understand when people get frustrated um, that they, you know, because of the way that the news portrays it, there's a, there's a huge reason to be frustrated when you hear somebody stole a car last week and a judge released them and then they, you know, stole a car again this week, you know, there's, there's cause for it to be concerned and there's cause for frustration. Um, but um, the solution isn't like I just said for the, I guess the same reasons, the solution is not just to throw the book at everybody and just incarcerate everybody. Um, and there's certainly, cer there are certainly times and it's an extremely um, important tool that we have to incarcerate people when it's necessary um, but we just have to use it in a practical manner when we're also looking at the re um, looking at all these other opportunities and services um, and again really working as a community um, and that's what I've been so impressed with with the work with the BCJCC um, is you know that there's you know a public defender and there's a police officer and there's you know city councilors and county commissioners and all kinds of different people judges and all these other people probation officers that are coming together and i just think it's really important that these stakeholders who maybe sometimes all have these ideas but they're not ever sitting down together actually having these tough conversations mm -hmm. um and i think that people when you do that are actually impressed with um maybe a certain stakeholder or agencies desire or ability to kind of work on some of these issues. Um, so I think that that's the other really important part of this is it's just, there's no, there's no simple easy answers to this, but um, I think when we organize and when stakeholders are actually taking the opportunity to kind of meet each other, meet with each other and actually start thinking outside the box and actually talking to each other, then we actually can make some headway and some, um, actually some really beneficial change yeah and reaching across those lines building partnerships it sounds like and yeah 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 it really does seem like a better way um well this has been a very informative conversation with you and and i thank you so much for taking the time to be here and and uh help me understand and help all of us understand the courts uh, better. I'd like to hear from you. Are there any closing thoughts that you'd like to leave us with? The only thing, just because uh, this is through the, um, the Democratic Party platform, I would just like to say um, I'm obviously on the ballot as a Democrat. Um, and I am running against a sitting Republican. Uh, when I ran in 2014, I actually beat a sitting Republican. Um, it's kind of tricky because these are partisan elections and I don't think anything that I just, I just kind of want to say too, nothing that I just said um, is partisan necessary. I don't think should be partisan in nature, but obviously a lot of some of the stuff that I'm talking about really relates to the core values of the democratic platform. And I think that that's important. But um, at the same point, uh, um, at the same time, I just want people to know that that's, uh, 
even if you don't believe that judicial elections should be partisan, um, that it's important to kind of take all those into consideration in terms of somebody's demeanor and how they'll be on the bench. And I think that that definitely contributes to my effectiveness um, as a judicial officer and who I will be as a judicial officer moving forward. Um, and so just make sure, obviously, people watching this, you know, like everybody's saying for 2016, um, if you have um, your absentee ballot at home, uh, fill it all the way out. That's the other thing I'll say is I'm kind of in the middle column. Um, so don't just vote for president and turn your ballot in. Make sure you, uh, if you can, fill out your entire ballot. You know, in, in terms of your voting, just make a plan and stick to it. Um, and I just really, really appreciate the time um, that everybody's taking to watch this video. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your time. And yes, Judge Courtney Weeks for District 15, Bernalillo County. Yes. Yes. And we are so honored to have you here talking with and to have you as a candidate. And thank you for stepping up to serve the community. You're obviously the right choice for all of us. And thank you for that. Madam uh, Chairman, yeah. thank you so much for the platform and the time. I mean, it means, uh, I can't tell you how much it means to me. It's been my honor and my pleasure. Thank you.